right? This, of course, is called the Licking River here now. Um, leading up to the Ohio River, I went to the Ohio River at the top right, the Little Miami, or then called the Little Mini Miami, uh, a totally different name, the Great Miami, um, and the White uh, Whitewater River running into it, etc. But the important is uh, the important point of this is uh, that uh, this area immediately became known as uh, for its elephant bones and became known immediately as Elephant Bone Lick, uh, and, and that's what it was called in the 1740s, 1740s. 50s, uh, 1760s, etc., etc. Um, it became, of course, very famous uh, because <laughs> because there were no elephants in North America, to anybody's knowledge, uh, and and therefore the idea that uh, you could, from the Big Bone Lick area, uh, procure bones of elephants uh, became quite something to have, especially if you were a richer, better known. American, uh, and, and especially the, the, the structures that were, uh, which were picked up and traded around because they were somewhat, they were somewhat transportable. Were these six, seven, eight, nine pound teeth, which were quite amazing things to have at your next uh, cocktail party. You know, uh, so uh, you know, we, most of the people in this room realize it's kind of fun to pull out these, these giant fossils, right, and, and amaze your friends, etc. Uh, one, one of the people who had such a tooth was this guy, George Washington. We're never sure how he got it. Uh, it's in Mount Vernon uh, still to this day. Uh, of course, George Washington got into the Ohio River Valley uh, early in his career. He was a land surveyor and then worked uh, as an army officer for the, for the British Army, um, but never got over as far as the Cincinnati region. Uh, but perhaps he traded for it. Uh, perhaps it was given to him. Uh, really no record of it, uh, even though he speaks of it on a couple of three occasions um, that, that we have recorded. I'm very proud of his uh, giant tooth, giant elephant tooth, as he called it. Another fellow who got quite a few bones and teeth from the lake was a guy better known as a scientist, Ben Franklin. Uh, ben Franklin also looking at tusks um, from the lake. Uh, ben being the scientist that he was, though, was one of the first people to start noticing that everything was not quite right about the story. Uh, specifically, as he looked at the teeth, he said, well, let's take a look at a surface, the chewing surface of, of this structure. And uh, what it looks like is, uh, well, a, a series of, of, of cusps, of, of upside down cones, if you will. There is the surface view of, uh, of, of one of the teeth I'm speaking of. And he said, now, that's interesting, and it's big, like an elephant tooth, but it ain't an elephant tooth. Because an elephant tooth, when you look at the surface, looks like that. And so uh, Ben Franklin was one of the first folks to point out that uh, whatever this thing is in Big Bone Lake, it ain't an elephant. Well, uh, that's an interesting uh, state of affairs after 20, 30, 40 years of people talking about the elephant bones coming out of, out, out of the lake. Um, you know, uh, so, so then the question comes up, uh, what is this? Uh, well. It's a structure of an unknown animal, uh, the animal incognito, as some people then referred to it, or the animal of the Ohio. Uh, it had several names, but no longer could it be called an elephant because, because it simply wasn't an elephant. So it was pretty obvious to everybody. Um, as to guesses as, as to what these bones were, here's one of the early folks who took a shot at it. It was determined these weren't elephant bones. Uh, this is uh, Ezra Stiles, president of Yale University, uh, and also a Protestant minister, as you might be tell by his, his get out there, his garb. Uh, being a, a minister back in that fundamentalist period especially, uh, he looked at the bones and, and these giant teeth that were coming out of the lake as proof of the Bible's correctness. Uh, specifically in the Old Testament, there, there's discussion about giants in the earth. And to prove that the, the Bible, of course, knew what it spoke of, and therefore other stories in the Bible were also probably true, uh, he looked at these bones and these teeth as those of human giants, uh, and said, "Hey, this is proof that the Old Testament's right. There were ele there, there were uh, there were giants in the earth in, in, in previous days." Uh, and he, however, was corrected uh, by an acquaintance of his, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who. Uh, who pointed out to, uh, to, to Dr. Stiles that uh, 
yeah, these couldn't really be human bones, human giant bones, uh, because of the simple fact that in addition to big bones and, and, and teeth, there also were tusks. Now, to Tazar Stiles' defense, uh, while he was in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, he saw a lot of the bones and teeth pass through on their way to New York or on their way to Boston. Uh, he never did see a tusk pass through, because the truth of the matter is, 10-foot tusks back in, in, in the uh, 1780s are rather difficult to transport. They're, they're somewhat delicate, though, as well. Uh, so he really hadn't known about the finding of tusks down in the lick, and uh, immediately upon finding out from Thomas Jefferson that the tusks were also part of the whole assemblage, uh, he admitted, okay, you're right, this, this, this unknown creature uh, is probably an unknown animal, not, not, a, not a human giant. Uh, meanwhile, over in France, uh, these folks at the Natural History Museum in France, which had gotten the original bones, and, and this was augmented as the years went by, because bones, teeth, and tusks kept coming out of here and being shipped, uh, both to the eastern coast of the United States, and from there to Paris, to London, to Amsterdam, to Berlin, to Stockholm. Um, little known among paleontology community here in Cincinnati is uh, the, the immense famous fossil locality that, that was known throughout the world, um, you know, this lick. Anyway, uh, the head of the museum back in the uh, late 1700s, uh, uh, Buffon, uh, probably the foremost scientist in the 18th century, wrote this huge encyclopedia. Uh, he looked at the bones that were they already had there in Paris um, and uh, came to a conclusion Again, a different conclusion as to explain the origin of these things. He said that simply what you're looking at, and the reason it's confusing you, is that uh, there are more than one animal represented here. There are, in fact, two animals. That the bones and the tusks are from elephants, but the teeth are from hippopotamuses. Okay? Which made some sense because if you look at a hippo tooth, it looks more like the tooth that was being found in the lick than the elephant tooth, as we already saw in the previous slide, uh, to which uh, our American paleontologist, Thomas Jefferson, said, baloney, uh, said, that's ridiculous. Uh, as Jefferson so well put it, he said, why in heaven's name would an elephant go to the lick and die and only leave its bones and tusks, but not its teeth? And vice versa, why would a hippopotamus go to the lick and die and only leave its teeth, but not its bones? He said, this is absurd. Uh, you know, I, no, Corey Jefferson, you know, pointed out once again that these are all the structures of a single animal, uh, not some combination of two different animals. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, you know, people said, yeah, you're right, these are just big bones, we don't know what they are. Uh, however, being the truth, uh, we will begin naming this area now Big Bone Lake. And the next maps uh, that came along in the 1780s, 1790s, and ever since, right up to the year 2008, it's ever since been known as Big Bone Lick because nobody knew what the bones were. So they were just big bones. Um, again, a, a later map, and therefore a better map, the rivers are uh, pretty much in, in the place uh, where, where they belong. Uh, here comes you know, the Licking River. Uh, uh, even the Mill Creek is up there, there, you can see. Creek, 10 yards wide, it appeared between the Little Miami uh, to your right and your Great Miami to your left. Uh, so, so, so here we are with the naming of, of the name that we know of uh, to this time, uh, Big Bone Lake. Why was Jefferson so into this? In fact, why was he even knowledgeable about this place? Well, you got to remember, Thomas Jefferson, up uh, until 1781, had been the governor of Virginia. And Virginia was a much bigger state in those days. It included Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. So Big Bone Lick was in his jurisdiction. So he, he knew about Big Bone Lick uh, right from the very beginning because he was the governor of the area when the state of Virginia was of that much larger size before it was busted into the three states that we know of today. Uh, he, on the other hand, was a little bit jealous of his friends Ben Franklin, George Washington, and others who had bones and teeth from there, because Jefferson, as many of you in this room realize, was quite a paleontologist himself, uh, and, and still didn't have any of the materials from Big Bone Lick, even though he had been governor of the, of the state in, in which uh, the, the lick 
is located. So, in, uh, in the 1780s, he uh, asked uh, his friend, uh, Daniel Boone, isn't this fun, just name dropping? <laughs> you know, why didn't you take two semesters of American history? You know, I think you could just have studied Big Bone and you find out everything, anybody that was anybody was, was, was associated right here. Uh, Daniel Boone, uh, Kentuckian of some note, uh, on his way back from Monticello, where he was visiting Jefferson, uh, to, to, to Kentucky, was asked by Jefferson to carry a letter. Uh, and, and Jefferson wrote this letter, uh, which Boone then delivered to, to this guy, George Rogers Clare, who was over in Louisville. He was the uh, 